delighted to introduce Mark Huxham, who, um, try and get your title right, the, you're now the Director of Academic Strategy and Practice at Edinburgh Napier, and very delightfully called Aspen. And I'm sure that Mark will maybe tell you a bit more about this, but Mark has been an advocate of uh, inclusive practice for a long time now, so we're delighted that he's going to um, come and speak to us this morning. So, over to you, Mark. Thank you. I'm going to start this presentation with a short formal assessment. Uh, there's no talking permitted, and if I see you cheating, uh, conferring or looking at notes, you'll be disqualified. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Um, you can start when I say, and there's only one question in this assessment, and I'd like you to write it down on a piece of paper, your answer please. So I'm not going to repeat the question. The assessment is a board, a board game and a die bought together cost £1.16. The board costs exactly £1 more than the die. How much does the die cost on its own? You have 60 seconds. Okay, let's, let me see who's passed my examination. Can, who, who wrote something down? So most people fail immediately. If you haven't written anything down, I thought you was right. Well, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. Um, is anyone brave enough to tell me what they wrote down? The die was free. Uh, if that was the case, £1.16 wouldn't be exactly £1 more than the die. You didn't say it, did did you? Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, you're right then, I'm wrong. I call 16p. 16p. So the, the, the answer is 8p. Um, £1.8 eight is exactly £1 more than 8p. Um, did anyone get that right? Oh. Ran, ran <laughs> okay. what, what I was attempting to do, um, it's, it's quite tricky actually, most people find that question quite tricky yeah. under pressure. Um, and what I was attempting to do was to recreate some of the kind of emotions um, that are not unfamiliar to <coughs> most students. So most students experience this sort of assessment quite often during their school years and also during their university years. And it's interesting for me that that brings, clearly there's content there, there's, a map, there's some mathematical content in that question, actually quite a trivial mathematical question that we all, we all understand as soon as we say it. But more importantly, there's a big, it's wrapped in a big emotional package. Um, so for many people, that kind of experience will remind them of, well, less than pleasant uh, assessment experiences. So what I wanted to do with you just in this 25 minutes or so was not really talk specifically about dyslexia at all, um, but rather to reflect on the fact that people with dyslexia learn differently from people without dyslexia, and as indeed does every individual learn differently from every other individual. So for me, it's the, the key message is around recognising diversity and thinking about how we as teachers um, can assess being cognisant of that, but also teach being cognisant of that. So I wanted to just kind of question some of these, these, basic, these basic questions, actually, around what we do, particularly in assessment. I wanted to think about why we might assess people, um, either at university or at school level, just generally through life, um, how we might do that, uh, what we might assess, and, and finally how we might do that. So, um, one of the reasons why we might assess people is to segregate them, and that's prob probably, socially, it's been probably the most important reason for assessment, um, historically, and arguably, it's the most important reason still. Uh, this is a picture from, um, from the favelas, actually, um, and this, this country is notoriously socially divided, uh, Brazil. It's got a massive divide between rich and poor, and people are quite used to this kind of distinction between the rich um, and the poor. And I guess anyone in trap, well, we, we, have, we have those kinds of problems in our own country, um, but they're particularly stark if you travel in third world, third world and developing nations. So one of the reasons, one of the reasons why you might assess people is around social divisions, to make sure that as far as society is concerned, you end up on the right side of that, that barrier. Um, I went to a grammar school, um, a state-funded grammar school. They still exist. I come from the south of England. Um, and so when I was 12, when I was 11, I took an exam. And even at the age of 11, I understood what the, the purpose of that exam was. I understood that it was to separate me from my 
my friends. And actually, I was, very, I was ashamed to go to the, the grammar school. And my former friends, who went to sell down um, modern, modern comprehensive, sell down secondary modern, um, which is an amazing name, isn't it? They called it sell down. Um, my friends, within a year, they were no longer my friends. They were my enemies, and they used to throw stones at me. So um, that was about social division. And so we can assess for that way. And I suppose if you set 10, if you have an assessment that says 10% of people will pass, that's essentially what you're doing. You're, you're making sure that there's a, there's a segregation. And these kinds of assessments, either formal or informal, are really effective. They're, they're effective in our, in our um, country. I want to introduce you to default man. I'll explain what I mean by default man. Actually, this is Cyril Burt. And Cyril Burt was the, the founder of grammar schools, in some ways, the intellectual uh, godfather of grammar schools. He advised the UK government um, in the 30s and 40s. And on the basis of his pedagogical device, advice, the modern grammar schools were established. Um, and he did a lot of work in IQ. So his, um, he's recognized for for codifying IQ. Um, one of the interesting things about C Cyril Burt is that he had two uh, assistants, two female assistants, who did most of this work with him um, and um, acknowledged, and even on his papers, um, as co-authors. And after his death, a journalist, I think from the Times, tried to follow these assistants up to interview them and couldn't find them. And it seems that he just made them up. He just made up, he just made up huge amounts of data. So he, prob he probably did some original work, but clearly a lot of his published work, which forms the foundation of grammar schools in the UK, is just fabricated. Um, it didn't stop him becoming Sir Cyril Burton, a very important member of the establishment. One of the reasons might be because he, he looks like power. He's a default man. So as I say, uh, we're, we're quite good in the UK at selecting certain types of people to run our society. 93% of executive directors in the UK are white men. We've still got 77% of MPs who are, who are men. Um, our private education system does, really good, does a really good job at selecting out a really small number of people with a really small number of characteristics. So I find this one staggering. 50% of A&A &A star grades, that's in A-levels. Um, of course, it's different here in, the, in Scotland, although a lot of our privately educated kids here in Scotland also do A-levels. 50% um, uh, of those grades go just to the 7% kids that are privately educated. Um, and there's a huge disparity in the money that we spend on state educated and privately educated kids in this country. So that's not just down to assessment, I know, but clearly assessments are doing a pretty good job at segregating people. I wanted to read you um, a piece from Grayson Perry, um, who, I, who I really admire. Um, he wrote a piece just recently, actually, in the NS, uh, the, the, the New Statesman, and it's about what he calls default man. Um, he says, paddle your canoe up the River Thames and you'll come round the bend and see a forest of huge totems jutting into the sky. Great shiny monoliths in various phallic shapes. They are the wondrous cultural artifacts of a remarkable tribe. We all know someone from this powerful tribe, but we very rarely, if ever, ascribe their power to the fact that they have a particular tribal identity. I think this tribe, a small minority of our native population, needs closer examination. In the UK, its members probably make up about 10% of the population. Globally, probably less than 1%. In a phrase used more often in association with Operation Yew Tree, they are among us and hide in plain sight. They dominate the upper echelons of our society, imposing, unconsciously or otherwise, their values and preference on the rest of the population. With their colorful textile phalluses hanging around their necks, they make up an overwhelming majority in government, in boardrooms, and also in the media. They are, of course, white, middle-class, heterosexual men, usually middle-aged. Um, so we do quite good, we do quite well at, at kind of encouraging those people. Um, later on in his piece, actually, he's got a really nice description from a guy called John Scalzi, um, who said he thought that being a straight white male was like playing the computer game called Life, with the difficulty setting on easy. So, that's one reason why we might assess people. And I guess you might not be surprised to think that's probably, I think that's probably a bad reason why we might assess people. Uh, and we want to ask ourselves really, really hard questions around our assessments about whether they're, they're supporting particular groups in society, particularly that particular tribe in society. Um, so probably sheer segregation, we could argue, is a bad 
a, a bad argument for, for, for assessment. Here's an alternative argument for assessment. Um, I just put this, this up because um, it's actually about group work as well, um, this diagram. But because the guy can't drive his tractor, you know, without the help of his wife. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's to illustrate another kind of, of approach to assessment, um, which is like the driving test. Um, presumably, he hasn't passed the driving test, I'm not sure. But the driving test is not about segregation um, because it's, it's competence based. So, in principle, everyone can pass the driving test, or almost everyone. Um, and the purpose of the driving test is, is, is to facilitate that, it's to allow people um, to reach a competence where they can be allowed out onto the roads. So that's at the other end of assessment philosophies, I think, from segregation. Um, you can have an assessment that, in principle, uh, is designed, actually, for, for a maximum number of people to pass, provided they meet the criteria. So that's another possibility. Um, here's a third one, um, and it can combine both of those possibilities. Um, and it's assessment for learning. So you can have an assessment to segregate people, you can have an assessment to credentialise people, or you can have an assessment that actually encourages and facilitates learning. So in the stories of Zen masters, it's very common to hear about people being hit by sticks. They've even got a special name for the stick, which I've forgotten. Now. So it's a sort of Zen hitting stick. So often the Zen masters hit their pupils. Um, which seems kind of an odd thing for them to do, especially as their Zen Buddhism is about compassion and other things. Um, but this is an essential part of a tool for learning. So students are set various assessment tasks, um, like looking after the master or cooking the food, um, and often the master, as in this case, will, will creep up behind them and whack them with a stick. And in some of the stories, the, the students are even asleep when he does this, and they, they endure year, years of this kind of assessment. And the point of the assessment is to encourage enlightenment. Um, and they learn through being hit. So in this case, um, actually, uh, Matajuro was training, this is, this is from the Japanese tradition, he was training to be a, a swordsman, and he wasn't taught a sword at all in the story for three or four years. He was just hit by his master with a stick um, at random intervals. And when he managed to achieve this moment of intuitive fending with the pot, then he's, he's become a master swordsman. So through the assessment, through the repeated assessment, um, he's achieved learning. Um, so what we're trying to do at university, um, and I, I would hope at schools as well, is think about assessments mostly from the perspective of achieving learning, trying to drive learning. It's slightly counterintuitive, that, I, that idea, or it was for me anyway, because you think, well, do I, do, I need, do I need an assessment in order to learn something that I want to learn? Um, and that's a broader question, I guess, although I, do, I, I admit, um, I admit to, to doing a course at this university a few years ago, being judged by my peers, by, by, by people I respected, um, and the assessment was coming out. I didn't need the assessment. I was doing it for my personal development. Um, but it, it was an exam. An exam was looming. And I remember you know, a few days before the exam, I thought, oh, I've got a bit of of a tickle in my throat, maybe, maybe I'd just better phone up and apologise, I'm not, not quite well, and I was thinking, what am I doing actually? So I was quite nervous about the assessment, and the nervousness definitely made me, made me work. Um, so we want assessments that, that drive learning. Um, so that's about why we might assess. Um, when we think about what we might assess, actually, I think there's one question that we want to assess, which is, show me that you've achieved the learning outcomes of whatever course, program, <coughs> module that you're doing. That's what we're assessing. Um, anything else is doing something else. It's, it's, it's not part of what we should be doing. Show me that you've achieved these learning outcomes. And how we do that um, is really dependent on the context and the students that we have. So um, that's what we should be assessing. That's not always what we assess. Um, so here's some, some approaches to this. We could take subject benchmarks from the QAA, and we all do, that's the Quality Assurance Agency. So at universities, they um, oversee the quality of what we teach. And the QAA brings together subject discipline experts um, to talk about what, what does it mean to be a geographer? What does it mean to be a mathematician? And they come up with a list of things that it means uh, this to be a geographer. So usually those statements are so broad, actually, that they're, they, they could apply to almost any subjects. They're extremely broad, and that's, that's something that you get from deciding these things by committee. Um, 
Uh, you, often academics and teachers have very dogmatic ideas about what it means to be a, a, a chemist or whatever it is their discipline is. When I started teaching, I thought to be a, an environmental biologist and an ecologist, you must understand link differential lock of Volterra equations because without those, you can't predict population dynamics of lemmings in the high Arctic. And that's a classic you know, ecological case study. So I spent four or five years teaching that to my students. Every year I teach, they always hated it. I was never quite sure that I understood it myself. Um, and then I stopped doing that and I didn't notice any, I didn't notice my students failing to get jobs or, uh, I'm not aware of any student actually who's gone on to want to predict population dynamics of lemmings in the high Arctic. So it was just one of those things, you know, and I'm sure all of us, based on my experience as a student. Um, so subject benchmarks are okay, but they, they're, they're a bit vague. Um, if we rely on our own recollections, they'll be subjective. Perhaps the better idea is to think about threshold concepts. A threshold concept is that idea of really something that is quintessential to thinking like a subject discipline expert. So to give you an example from, from biology, understanding evolution by natural selection is a, is a threshold concept. If you don't understand that, then well, most biologists would argue you, you're not a biologist, you're, you're not thinking like a biologist. In economics, it might be opportunity cost or something like that. Um, so that's a kind of slightly more theoretically interesting way of thinking about benchmarks. But then, these are just discipline-specific discipline things, and mostly um, <coughs> in universities, across universities, certainly across this university, we're interested in much broader outcomes than that. So we're interested in graduate attributes. Um, and that, as we know from speaking to employers in particular, they're interested in a whole range of skills which aren't discipline specific. So typically communication skills and group working um, and initiative and these things. So perhaps we should be assessing for those. And then thinking more broadly than that, what's wrong with assessing for kind of being a nice person or decency? Can we assess for that? Maybe we should try, I don't know. Uh, we don't do it at the moment. Uh, maybe we do in some subjects actually, if you're teaching nurses, you're probably quite interested in emotional issues and in empathy, for example. So, what we, what we select, what we, what we choose to, 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 to teach and to assess should be that, I think. Um, but what the learning outcomes are is up for discussion and debate within subjects. Okay, so how might we assess these things? Well, if we assume that our students are all the same, then we can assess them in one way. But if we don't, and we know, we know that they're not, if we don't want to just assess the great white males, for example, for default, default man, then we better think about using an appropriate range of assessment strategies. And the point I'm going to make is a really obvious one, I suppose, but the assessment strategy that we choose is not opaque. It comes bundled up with all sorts of assumptions about the implied student that we're assessing. I just want to give you one very brief example from, from my uh, research. So I was interested in using oral assessments with students. Um, so I ran an exam, and I could run the exam like this, people sitting uh, in silence, doing under pressure like you, you guys were a moment ago. Um, but an alternative to doing that is to have an oral exam. And oral exams, at least in undergraduate education in British universities, have fallen out of favour, partly because they're, they're not anonymous. Um, so they're seen as open to bias. Um, so they've fallen out of favour. But that's quite, that itself is an interesting dis, uh, di, uh, decision, because um, in, this, in this piece of work, we, we randomised uh, exam questions. We randomised exam questions between groups of students, and they were either asked orally, or they were asked to respond to those questions in writing. And so we were able to compare student responses to those, so same questions, but asked in different ways. Um, and what we found, this is just an example of some of the writing, actually. Um, so a lot of my colleagues like to complain about students. Well, we all, we all do as teachers, aren't we? Students, they're not like they used to be. Students don't read anything. Oh, their writing's terrible. Actually, there is, some, there is, there is evidence that students read a lot less than they used to. Good evidence. Um, and that their handwriting is not particularly good. Um, it's not surprising, because pe young people spend their time typing now. So that's kind of fairly typical, actually. These are first-year students of the kind of uh, written responses you might get if you ask for short written responses in, in exams. 
Um, not, not, not great. Um, if you compare the marks that students got, and this was with first year students and, and fourth year students actually, repeated twice over two years, it was a very consistent effect that students do better in oral examinations. Um, and that was almost, not all students, but it was a very consistent and significantly, statistically significant effect. Um, that was interesting for me. We asked the students how anxious they were, and mostly they were more anxious about the oral exam than the written exam, um, probably because they hadn't experienced it as much. So it wasn't to do with that, or maybe it was to do with their anxiety, maybe they revised more if they knew an oral exam was coming up. Um, the students who were dyslexic, who, were, who I knew were dyslexic in that class, uh, many of them contacted me beforehand, or four or five, I say many, there weren't loads, but four or five of them contacted me beforehand and said, look Mark, we, we agreed we're doing this little experiment, I want to be in the, in the oral group. So that's not a big sample size, but um, there's strong evidence there that dyslexics in particular wanted to be orally assessed. So that was interesting for me because I thought, why am I, what's important about a written assessment here in this particular module? I wanted to understand their, what they knew about evolution um, and, and, and ecological theory. There was nothing in my learning outcome that said you have to write well or you have to spell well. Now those things are important. I'm not saying that we shouldn't assess for spelling and writing. Maybe we, sh we should. But in this module, it wasn't a learning outcome. But clearly I was disadvantaging many students by choosing to use written assessment methods. Um, so, the conclusions of that work, um, different students did better, um, they, uh, very significantly, uh, consistently they did better in oral compared with written tests. Um, students with dyslexia in particular requested to, to, to not be randomly allocated, to be in the oral group. Um, I think probably one of, the, one of the main reasons that people do better in the oral situation, in my, in my experience, was that students were able to probe the understanding of the question. So the question I started with here, I explicitly said to you, you weren't able to ask me anything about it. So your working memory had to grab what I said very fast and hang on to it. Um, and we know from, from written exams that written language is very opaque and it's very easy for us to use jargon without realising it. And almost all word, words have multiple meanings. So that's really difficult for our international students as well. And what was very common in this examination was that students said, I don't understand that question, can you rephrase it? And under the rules that we set up as researchers, we allowed that, so we, we rephrased the question. Ah, oh, right, I understand. Um, that's very, very common. So I suppose one of the worst, worst things, is that I'm sure many of you are teachers as well, but one of the worst experiences in marking exams when you just think, this person is answering a different question. And often, if, if it's about the 50th exam and the second glass of wine, you've you're, 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 you're not feeling sympathetic towards the students, but actually, often the reason they're asking the wrong question is not because they've just revised for that question, but they haven't understood the question that you've, aren't, you've asked. Um, so my point is a simple one, that whatever assessment method we choose, um, it's not value neutral, um, it's, it's opaque. We're not just assessing what we think of as content, we're assessing a whole bundle of skills and emotional approaches and aptitudes as well. Um, very quickly, um, before I run out of time, I wanted to share this with you because I've been talking about assessment, but I also want to think about teaching and learning styles a little bit as well. Um, so one of the things that we, I guess, we, we take absolutely for granted, or most of us take for granted, is the ability of our students to listen orally to, to information in a classroom setting and to synthesise that information and to record it. Um, and there's good reasons why our students should be taking notes. So one response to this is just, well, hand them a textbook. Well, what are they doing in the class if you do that? They don't need to come at all. So good reasons to take notes. Um, here's some really nice notes. This is from an evolution lecture. This is a, a verbatim. What I did was hand students some, some it's not carbon paper, but it used to be called carbon, co carbon copy paper, um, so that I could see their notes. I looked at hundreds of sets of notes of students. So that's quite a nice summary, actually, of a 50 minute lecture with, with slides and other things that they've got. Um, but that was really unusual. That's less than 2% of students were coming up with that kind of summary. This was much more usual. Um, that's, a, that's a whole hour, you know, listening to my wonderful, my wisdom, my pearls of wisdom. I was really shocked when I did this research. I've said so many important things and these students, look at that. Rubbish. Well, actually it's not rubbish, it's okay, but 
But I was really shocked that they were not, they weren't picking up the cues actually of what I thought were important. And so actually I did this over two years. 2% 2 of students in the first year did not so-called non-linear notes, a bit like those concept maps. None in the second year. Um, most students don't use abbreviations at all. They, no, they don't know, they don't know EGs, you know, etc. They don't, they, they never use them. They weren't there in their notes. Um, so actually these students don't know how to take notes and I, I, they're probably perfectly representative. I don't know any reason why they wouldn't be. Um, so I was making a lot of assumptions about the skills of my students um, and of course I can change my teaching practice on the back of, of this new knowledge. So um, the, my message is a simple one really, whether, whether it's assessment and particularly but assessment is particularly important because we tend to use it for segregation in our society, either consciously or unconsciously, or whether it's teaching and learning more, more, more broadly. Um, what we should be focusing on is the learning of our students, um, rather than worrying too much, I guess, about um, rather more abstract issues like validity um, and reliability, in, in, in my view. And it's just being aware that whatever way we teach and whatever way we assess, comes bundled with a whole lot of assumptions that we need to scrutinise. Thank you.